church, whether you're here with us in person or worshiping online, we are glad that we can worship Christ and his cross. And we're going to talk about the cross this evening. And we're also going to take communion at the end of our worship service. And so if you're with us in person, we'll do that at the very end. And I'll give you a little bit of direction um, when we get to that point in the service. If you're with us worshiping online and you haven't yet gathered the elements, you simply need some bread and some wine or some juice, enough for each person in your household who wishes to partake. And I always or often say when we have communion here at St. Paul that we are all equally guests, beggars, when we come to the table. Jesus is the host, and he invites any and all who hunger for the forgiveness and grace that he offers to come to the table. So know if you hunger for Jesus today, you are welcome at his table. I have a couple of other announcements. First and foremost, check your newsletter and your e-news. This week, or next week I should say, you will be getting a newsletter in your email inbox or your mailbox. And if you don't get our monthly newsletter, um, and would like to, now is the time to let us know. You can do that by emailing secretary at stpaulbeloit.org or um, just message us on our Facebook page. That will get to us quickly as well. Let us know how you want to receive it, how we can get it to you, and we will be sure to add you to that list. Um, there's, there's a lot in there about how you can be involved in various ways. Let me highlight one thing that is in our e-news and in that newsletter. September 13th, which is coming up in two weeks, uh, just over two weeks, is we're going to try a new thing, parking lot coffee hour. At around 10.15, after the uh, Sunday morning service, it's BYO, which stands for Bring Your Own. So BYO everything, Bring Your Own chair, bring a lawn chair or some kind of folding chair with you, um, bring your own snacks, coffee, brunch, whatever you want to have. Um, feel free to bring other members of your household, bring your masks, and we're going to set up in the upper parking lot and in the lawn um, across the way there, socially distanced in small groups, you know, with our chairs apart, but it's an opportunity to have what I know we are all longing for some face-to-face, in-person fellowship time. So as you feel safe, we just want to invite you to join us September 13th um, for that parking lot coffee hour around 10.15 a.m. outside. Everything else I'm going to make you read in your newsletter. And so I invite you now, take some deep breaths, and let's prepare ourselves for a time of confession and Blessed be the Holy Trinity, one God, whose steadfast love is everlasting, whose faithfulness endures from generation to generation. Amen. Let us confess our sins, trusting in God's mercy and forgiveness. For those times when we have lost sight of your love, falling into despair for ourselves and the world. Heal us, God, and grant us a new beginning. For those times when we have lost perspective, putting our own concerns before the needs of all, Heal us, God, and grant us to be with you. For those times when we have taken for granted the gifts that you have given to us. Heal us, God, and grant us to be with you. For those times when we have chosen to ignore injustice, and neglected those in need. Heal 
heal us, God, and grant us a new beginning. God has heard our confession, loves us still, and through Christ offers healing and a new beginning. Hear then Christ's gracious words. Your sins are forgiven. Amen. Thanks be to God. First reading is from Exodus chapter 3, verses 1 through 15. Moses was taking care of the flock for his father-in-law Jethro, Midian's priest. He led his flock out to the edge of the desert, and he came to God's mountain called Horeb. The Lord's messenger appeared to him in a flame of fire in the middle of a bush. Moses saw that the bush was in flames, but it didn't burn up. Then Moses said to himself, Let me check out this amazing sight and find out why the bush is not burning up. When the Lord saw that he was coming to look, God called to him out of the bush, Moses, Moses. Moses said, I'm here. Then the Lord said, don't come any closer. Take off your sandals because you are standing on holy ground. He continued, I am the God of your father, Abraham's God, Isaac's God, and Jacob's God. Moses hid his face because he was afraid to look at God. Then the Lord said, I've clearly seen my people oppressed in Egypt. I've heard their cry of injustice because of their slave masters. I know about their pain. I've come down to rescue them from the Egyptians in order to take them out of that land and bring them to a good and broad land, a land that's full of milk and honey, a place where the Canaanites, the Hittites, the Amorites, the Perizzites, the Hivites, and the Jebusites all live. Now the Israelites' cries of injustice have reached me. I've seen just how much the Egyptians have oppressed them. So get going. I'm sending you to Pharaoh to bring my people, the Israelites, out of Egypt. But Moses said to God, Who am I to go to Pharaoh and to bring the Israelites out of Egypt? God said, I'll be with you, and this will show you that I'm the one who sent you. After you bring the people out of Egypt, you will come back here and worship God on this mountain. But Moses said to God, If I now come to the Israelites and say to them, the God of your ancestors has sent me to you. They're going to ask me, what's this God's name? What am I supposed to say to them? God said to Moses, I am who I am. So say to the Israelites, I am has sent me to you. And God continued, 
Say to the Israelites, The Lord, the God of your ancestors, Abraham's God, Isaac's God, and Jacob's God, has sent me to you. This is my name forever. This is how all generations will remember me. Word of God, Word of Life. The Holy Gospel according to Matthew, the 16th chapter. From that time, after Peter had confessed that Jesus was the Messiah, Jesus began to show his disciples that he had to go to Jerusalem and suffer many things from the elders, chief priests, and legal experts, and that he had to be killed and raised on the third day. Then Peter took a hold of Jesus and scolding him, began to correct him. God forbid, Lord, this won't happen to you. But he turned to Peter and said, Get behind me, Satan. You are a stone that could make me stumble, for you are not thinking God's thoughts, but human thoughts. Then Jesus said to his disciples, All who want to come after me must say no to themselves, take up their cross, and follow me. All who want to save their lives will lose them, but all who lose their lives because of me will find them. Why would people gain the whole world but lose their lives? What will people give in exchange for their lives? For the Son of Man, the human one, is about to come with the majesty of his fathers with his angels. And then he will repay each one for what the person has done. I assure you, some standing here won't die before they see the human one coming in his kingdom. The Gospel of our Lord. Praise, Praise to you, Christ. Christ. Today's story of Jesus' exchange with Peter is really the second half of the story that we talked about last week. The one in which Peter shines in his discipleship and faith. Jesus, if you remember, asked his disciples, who do you say that I am? And Peter speaks up immediately and says, you are the Messiah, the Christ, the Son of the living God. Jesus praises him and declares that on the rock of Peter, he will build his church. I can't really blame the lectionary authors for splitting what's really one story in the gospel into two. Because it's kind of nice to give Peter one week of shining glory before it all comes crashing down. It is interesting, though, that Matthew goes straight from that story into this one. The one in which Peter, the rock on which the church is built, rebukes Jesus, tries to correct him, and Jesus turns around to him and says, Get behind me, Satan. You're a stone that could make me stumble. How the mighty have fallen, as we say. Peter, as always, is a great representative of us all. He's capable of bold faith and insight and almost in the same breath of completely missing the point. And it's hard to blame him. Jesus has just told him that he will build his church upon him. Isn't it natural that Peter would think it's his job to protect Jesus, to protect that church from danger, from suffering, from death? But Peter doesn't get it. He knows who Jesus is, the Messiah, the Christ, but he doesn't understand what that identity means yet. This is an important lesson for Peter and for all disciples, for us, because just like we talked about last week, understanding who Jesus is is key to understanding who we truly are. What does it mean to follow Jesus? What does it mean to take up our cross and walk after 
Jesus towards Jerusalem. It means letting go of that instinct of self-protection. I read a commentary this week from preacher and author Barbara Brown Taylor, and her words struck me so hard, I'm going to read you a long passage out of what she writes. I want to believe that God gives me life, and God can't be eager to take it away. Doesn't God want me to be happy? Doesn't God care about my comfort and safety? The resounding answer, according to this passage in Matthew, is no. God doesn't care about my comfort and safety. God does not care whether I am happy or not. What God does care about is the quality of my life. And not just the continuation of my breath, the health of my cells, but the quality of my life, the depth, the heft and zest of my life. The deep secret of Jesus' hard words to us in this passage is that our fear of suffering and death robs us of life. Because fear of death always turns into fear of life, into a stingy, cautious way of living that is not really living at all. The deep secret of Jesus' hard words is that the way to have abundant life is not to save it up, but to spend it, to give it away. Because life cannot be shut up and saved any more than fresh spring water can be put in a mason jar and kept in a kitchen cupboard. If you ever open it up, you can probably still drink it, but it will have lost its essence, its life, which is to be poured out, to be moving, living water rushing downstream to share its wealth without ever looking back. Peter didn't want Jesus' life to be spilled, to be wasted. He wanted to save it, to find a safer, more comfortable way for Jesus to be Lord. Taylor goes on to talk about what Peter has missed, the point that he has somehow lost track of when he gets stuck, as we do, on the suffering and death. We get stuck there, but Jesus, in his teaching to his disciples and to us, doesn't stop at, I must go to Jerusalem and be betrayed and be killed. No, he goes on and says, and on the third day, to rise again. Suffering and death, are inevitable, friends. We don't have to invite them. We don't have to seek them out. I don't believe God wants us to seek suffering, but they will come to us sooner or later in our lives. But the deeper, harder to remember, but utterly vital truth is this. In Christ, life is even more inevitable than death. Resurrection is also inevitable. It will also find us and claim us. And the way that we get to cling to resurrection is by letting go of the vain effort to preserve our human life at any cost, and instead to spill it out, to give lavishly, even recklessly, for the sake of the world, just as Jesus did. Taylor says again, to follow Jesus means going beyond the limits of our own comfort and safety. It means receiving our lives as gift instead of guarding them as possessions. The temptation, at least for me, when I hear these words of Jesus, if anyone wants to come after me, she must deny herself, take up her cross, and follow me, is to do one of three things. Spiritualize them, minimize them, 
or aggrandize them. We spiritualize that when we say, well, Jesus doesn't literally mean give up your life. We minimize it when we say, well, it's hard to be kind to this really irritating person at work, but it's my cross to bear. And we aggrandize them when we say things like, wow, I'm so grateful God hasn't asked me to stand up to the Nazis and get sent to a concentration camp. Some people really do have to lay down their lives for the gospel. That phrase, though, is pretty clear. And we're going to hear it again in Matthew's gospel. Jesus teaches this more than once. Everyone who follows Jesus will be asked to lay down their lives. We must surrender our lives in order to gain the life that God has to offer. And that doesn't just mean tweaking it with niceness and a little extra giving sometimes. It means real sacrifice, real death to ourselves, real giving up what we have come to. I can't help this week but ask of you and myself that we ponder what this passage means in the light of the racial tensions, the violence, the political rhetoric that is dividing our state and our nation. What does it mean for the people of God to lay down our lives, to quit trying to preserve them in comfort and safety, to treat them not as possessions, but to offer them up as gifts. What does it mean to love in the mundane, extravagant, counter to human nature way that Jesus does? Because the kind of love that Jesus embodies a love that lays down its life for the other is absolutely counter to our human instincts. What does it mean to enter into the suffering and death of our world with hope and conviction that losing our lives can lead to resurrection, that surrendering our own goals and ambitions, our own goal, our own plans and dreams can lead to life that can never be taken away. What does it mean for us right now in this time and place? I know that our black and brown siblings in Christ probably know better than we do what it means to lay down a life that you can't protect in order to gain a life that only Jesus can give. We, and I'm speaking now to our white, mostly middle class, comfortable church, we have been protected largely in body and property and perspective in a bubble. But the truth is, it's costing us our soul costing the church in this country its soul. It's costing our nation our soul. I weep and rage, and I know you do too, for the state of our world. And I know that if we surveyed us, we'd have a lot of disagreement about what the root problems are and how to fix them. What I'm saying is we have to start having that conversation. And I trust. I trust in the power of the Spirit and the power of the cross and the power of the body of Christ that by having the conversation we can start a journey towards healing, towards life for all. We have to have it if we're serious about working for the healing of the world. And it is a conversation that will have great promise. But it starts by laying down our lives. 
by surrendering self-preservation, by letting go of self-protection, by letting go of the way we've always seen the world, and even of things like reputation and retirement savings. We must lay down our lives. We must lose them. Jesus is clear. We must die to ourselves. And we can only do that through faith in the one who has already laid it all down for us. And in doing so, promised us that beyond the pain, beyond the anger, beyond the repentance, beyond the weeping and the rage, beyond the suffering and death, there is resurrection. There is life. encouraged to share your prayer concerns by typing a name or a few words in a comment box on YouTube or Facebook or by saying the names aloud. We gather together in lifting our prayers to God. God of faithfulness, you bid your people to follow Jesus. 
Set the mind of your church on divine things. Grant us trust in you that we lose our lives for the sake of Christ and thereby discover joy and life through him. God of wonder, the earth is yours and all that is in it. Heal your creation and give us eyes to see the world as you see it. As seasons change, pattern the rhythm of our lives in harmony with all creation. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. God of nations, you call us to live peacefully with all. Give us ears to hear one another, even those we name as enemies. Fill all leaders with mercy and understanding that they advocate and genuinely care for those who are poor and most vulnerable in their communities. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. God of salvation, you promise to deliver us. Give those who suffer a strong sense of your presence and love. Accompany those who are uncertain. Raise the spirits of those who are despairing. Heal the sick. We pray especially for all those on our prayer list and those whom we name before you now. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. God of community, you call us to rejoice in hope, be patient in suffering, and persevere in prayer. Make our congregation a workshop of your love. When we quarrel, bring us reconciliation. Help us to overcome evil with good. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. God of grace, you give us everlasting life. In love, we recall our holy ones who are now living in your undying light. In our remembering, give us a foretaste of the feast that is to come. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. In the certain hope that nothing can separate us from your love, we offer these prayers to you through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. The peace of Christ be with you always. Also you. I invite you now to share a sign of God's peace, whether that's in person by turning and gesturing, or by sharing a text or an email or a phone call with someone. Share the peace of Christ. Yeah. 
she was betrayed, our Lord Jesus took the bread. He gave thanks, and he broke it, and gave it to his disciples, saying, This is my body, given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Again, at the end of the supper, he took the cup. He blessed it and gave it to each one to drink, saying, This cup is a new covenant in my blood, shed for you and for all people for the forgiveness of sin. Do this in remembrance of me. Together as the body of Christ, we proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Christ, Christ has died. died. Christ, Christ is risen. Christ, Christ will come, come again. again. Gathered into one by the Holy Spirit, let us pray as Jesus taught us. Our Father, Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. The bread of life and the cup of salvation given for you. Amen. Thank you. 